Well, good morning, church. So I welcome everybody this morning. If you're visiting with us, well, you know, you're very welcome. We're going to praise the Lord here in just a few minutes. But I just have a simple announcement that we want to share with you before we get started. So, Brother Chuck, if you'll come on up. Just a quick announcement. Uh, some of you may have noticed some changes in our sanctuary. We have a combination of a blue light and a red light. And we just thought it'd be good to inform you guys what that means. Carl, go ahead with the blue light. If you see the blue light strobing and flashing in any Sunday school class, in any room you're in, uh, sanctuary downstairs, doesn't matter where you're at, that means there's some type of possible security threat on the campus. And that means you need to barricade yourself, stay where you're at, follow the run, hide, fight procedures. That's what that is for. That's in case of a security threat. All right, go with the red light. The red light means we got smoke in the building, we've got an earthquake, we've got something that we need to evacuate for. So if you see the red light flashing, that means to get out of the building. The staging area, of course, would be out front unless that entryway is blocked and then you're going to have to go out one of these other exits. So make sure you familiarize yourself with the entries and, the, and exits of the building so that you can get out in a timely manner. That's all I had. Just wanted to explain that to you. If you have any questions, just come see me. I'll be here all morning. Thank you. So grateful for our security team. Everybody stand. Let's get ready to worship the Lord together.
what, what we are doing this morning is just a small, small, small taste of what they're doing in heaven. Amen? Amen? Heaven rejoices because they know who's worthy. Here's the thing. Nobody's asking, is he worthy? People are asking down here. But in heaven, everybody knows he is. Amen? He is. I was mindful that when you and I are singing that song, we are declaring what heaven is declaring. We're getting lined up with what heaven is already doing. And it would be a wonderful thing if all of our lives and every aspect of our lives could be just like that, where we are doing what heaven is doing, where we are declaring what heaven declares, where we know what heaven knows. And I want to ask you a question. Isn't that what you want, to have a little bit of heaven on earth? Just to have a little bit of heaven. I, I mean, I want it to be so good that I can tell you I'm almost there. I'm almost, it's so good, I feel like I'm almost there. Isn't that what you want? I mean, you got people, listen, you can go in the other direction if you want to. You can make this hell on earth if you want to. Some people do, but I'm going the other way. It's going to be heaven on earth for me. I'm following the king, amen? He is worthy. He is worthy. Say that with me. He is worthy. Oh, the person next to you doesn't believe it. Tell them, say, he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. We're going to come down to the altar and pray together here in just a moment. And that is the idea, the burden, the heart, the desire that I would love for us to bring into this time of prayer. Come down here telling him how worthy he is. And then let's see if we can get more of what heaven knows and is doing to happen here in our lives. As a matter of fact, you know this is the heart of God. The disciples asked Jesus, they said, teach us to pray. And he prayed this beautiful prayer. And at the end of it, he made this declaration, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see what God wants? He wants to do on earth what's already happening in heaven. And that's got to be our desire as well. Amen. Don't let anybody rob you of the hunger for heaven on earth. That's exactly what God wants to do. Jesus said the kingdom is here. That's what he said. They were looking around. They looked at him and he said, I'm telling you, the kingdom has come. That's the kind of mindset that the believer is supposed to have. Expecting God to do here what he's doing in heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, let's come pray together. Come on down. Tell him now as you come. Jesus, I've been singing it, but now I'm going to say it. You are worthy. I've been saying it, but now I'm going to pray it. You are worthy. You are worthy. you a good spot find you your own space to call down heaven I mean where do you think the father is responding from he's responding from above where do you think the blessings come from they come from his presence they come from the throne when God reaches down and touches somebody where is he reaching from It's in God's heart to invade the earth with his presence, to invade the earth with his glory, to invade our lives with the goodness of heaven. That's in the Father's heart. The question is, what's in your heart this morning? Have you been settling for too much of what you can already get down here? Or do you have a hunger for what only comes from above? Do you want your life to look more like heaven? You get to choose. says it sure is important 
what kind of mindset you bring. It really does matter what kind of perspective you have. What are the desires of your heart? What are the longings of your life? Can I share with you, in heaven there are no distractions. In heaven, Jesus has no competition. In heaven, every hindrance has already been removed. Why can't your life look like that now? Why can't that happen here? It can. That's what Jesus came to accomplish. To make himself known in such a grand way that you couldn't wait to move everything else out of his way. To reveal himself so uniquely to us that we would get every hindrance in our hindsight so that we could grab a hold of him. You see, you can't say I want heaven but cling to the things of earth. You can't say I want more of you, God, but settle for a bunch of stuff that's just getting in God's way. Make up your mind, Christian. Jesus, I gladly abandon. I give up. I forsake the things that are keeping me from experiencing more of you. I let it go so that I can take both of my hands and all of my heart and grab a hold of you. Some of you reaching for a bottle. You need to be reaching for the hand of God. Some of you are reaching for a relationship with somebody else. When you need to be reaching the heart of God for the satisfaction that only He can bring into your life. Some of you are reaching for more and more and more and more stuff. But I'm telling you, you need to be seeking more and more and more and more of the Spirit of God. heaven on earth your life conformed to look more like what life looks like in heaven you see I don't want heaven to be like me I don't need more of what I've already got I don't need any more distractions. I don't need any more hindrances. I don't need any more clutter. I need more of the clarity and beauty and peace and joy of heaven. He's worthy. He's worthy of this desire resonating in your heart. He's worthy of your seeking Him for a great outpouring. He's worthy of your being dissatisfied with the things that this world has to offer. He's worthy of this. He's worthy of your pursuing Him and Him alone. He's worthy of your hungering and thirsting after His righteousness. That's what He's worthy of. the deer longs for the water so my soul longs for you can I encourage you to give God free and total access into your life right now will not force his way he will only be welcomed he only goes and moves where he's wanted can you welcome him into your life every aspect of your life and welcome him in to do two things 
first to remove the clutter and then to fill that space up with something much, much better. Lord, invade my life. Invade my days. Invade my priorities. Invade the longings of my heart. Invade my desires. And burn up anything that cannot stay. If you don't allow it in heaven, God, I don't want to allow it in my life. If you don't put up with it there, I don't want to put up with it here. Burn it up, God. In your holiness, burn it up. Cleanse me, oh God, that I might be clean. Purify me. you're worthy you see that's got to be the why that's got to be the motive it can't be because I want it or because it's going to bless me you should want it and it will bless you but the motive of your heart has got to be Lord do this because you're worthy do it so that you get the glory do it so that another heart is turned only towards you Do it so that your will is accomplished here on earth as it is in heaven. Invade my home. Invade my marriage. Invade my family. Invade my job. is waiting I want to get a taste of it the Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good Lord we want to tell you as your sons and your daughters that we want more of whatever you want to give. We want more of your presence. We want more of your peace. We want more of your spirit. We want more joy. We want more victory. We want more boldness. We want more strength. We want more worship. More faith. We want more of you. Give us all that we can handle, all that we can hold. Fill us up to the brim. Lord, I want you to know that I am dissatisfied with the things of this world. I've tasted them and they do not compare. I've tried them. They cannot compete. You are better. You are more. So why, God, would I be willing to settle for anything less you and all that you long to accomplish in my life for your glory Father if there's clutter and debris in my own heart in your mercy God burn it up consume it and remove it God, if there are things that are distracting me from what you want to do, 
make me blind to those things, Lord, so that I might only see you, so that I might only look to you. Father, if there's a hindrance that is slowing me down, I pray that it would be removed as well. your holy name that it would be in your heart first to invade our lives to fill us up with your spirit to satisfy our mouths with your goodness to give us purpose with your plans Thank you that that's your heart towards your people. It's your heart towards us. And Father, I want to pray for those that are here. Lord, they may be in this place. They may have their their eyes closed and their head bowed. And they may even be listening. But God, they're not engaged with what's happening right now. They're just present, God. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm them and draw them to yourself. Show them, Lord, what they're missing out on. Give them a glimpse, God. so that they might be changed. Now is not the time, Lord, for lukewarmness. We want to be hot, on fire, excited, passionate about you. Your word, your glory, your promises, your plans, the future. about your desires for our lives passionate about telling other people who you are how wonderful you are declaring the gospel to anyone willing to listen Jesus we exalt you we honor you are worthy and you always will be it's by the spirit of God and in your name your great name that we pray all of these things amen 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 hey as you're going back to your seat now you got to tell five people he is worthy Five people. God, stand with us as we continue to worship this morning.
songs like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water on my skin.
Amen, church. I want you to get your Bibles out. We're going to be reading a few verses together here. So go ahead and get ready. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. You got it ready? Hold it up when you're ready now. Don't be afraid to show somebody. I'm ready for the Word of God. Well, whether you're ready or not, here it comes, all right? The Bible is God's Word. It has authority in my life. The Bible changes me. I don't change the Bible. All right, let's see what the Word of God will tell you today, Christian. If you're listening, he's going to speak. He always does, starting in verse 11 of Luke chapter 7. This is what the Bible says. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son. And a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. And the bearers stopped Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Aren't you thankful for God's word today? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. You know, I think that one way Jesus could be described, or at least one way he was described during his earthly ministry, especially by those who did not appreciate that ministry, they'd say something like, you got to watch out for Jesus. You got to watch out for that guy. Because even those who did not agree with him could not deny that he was always doing something that was unexpected. He was always moving in a direction when they thought he was going to step to the right, he went this way. When they thought he was going to answer like this, he answered like this instead. When they thought that he was going to just put his hand on a comforting and comfort a, a woman who was grieving the loss of her son, he ended up bringing the boy back to life. You see, when they thought he just had something to say, he had some more than something to say, he had something to do. And so they'd say, you've got to watch out for Jesus. Christian, I want to tell you something. It's a wonderful thing. You better still be watching out for him because Jesus still wants to move. The Lord Jesus Christ has all intentions to still move and work among and through his people, but by the power of his spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ, the Bible says. His intentions haven't changed. He may do it in different ways, but he's still wanting to do it. He's still wanting to work and move. And that's something that many in the church of Jesus Christ have forgotten. We've, we've drifted ever so gently, ever so slowly away from passages like the one we just read. We've relegated the miraculous to the past. We, we stick the spiritual stuff in the scripture, but we don't let it out and into our lives. And there are consequences for this faulty faith. And we're reaping those consequences. We still have faith. It just needs to be stirred up. You ever let a cup of coffee sit all day? You see what happens is something at the bottom begins to build. We call that sediment. And that's, that's actually the flavor that's the best part of the coffee, but it's settled to the bottom. Why? Because it's just been sitting there. And what needs to happen is that somebody needs to come along and stir that coffee up. 
Somebody needs to stir that good flavor, that sediment, back into the fullness of the cup. Why? So that when you take a sip from the top, you can taste what was only laying at the bottom. And that's what's going on in a lot of Christians' lives. That's what faith looks like for a lot of believers. It's, it's still there. But there's been some settling that has occurred. And the very best of what God's got has been allowed to just sink to the bottom and go unnoticed. Well, God's word comes along. And God's man who will preach God's word comes along with the purpose of what? Stirring up your faith. Stirring up up what already exists and reminding you that the same God that did it then is the same God who is Lord of your life now, that the same God who moved in miraculous ways has not changed his ways. He's still a miracle working God. Christian, I'm telling you, you need your faith stirred. You need to be jolted with the word of God. You need, you need there to be some friction, some holy friction between you and God. It's good for you to be confronted with his word in a passage like this. It's good for you to be jarred with what the scriptures say because here's what's going to happen if you don't let scripture jar you. This world is going to rock you to sleep. That's the goal. Is to just lull you into a... Settled state of faith to where you don't have the flavor. At least it's not something that can be tasted and seen. It's there, but it's never brought to the top. It never gets to come out. It's just contained. You see, the enemy of God knows that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The enemy knows this. It's the people of God that have forgotten this. And you need to be reminded. This passage of Scripture does not exist in its place only so that people who come to it later, like 2,100 years later, can make an excuse for it being there. Or can make an excuse for why it's there but not here. I promise you God didn't put it in his word for somebody who claims to know God to explain away. I promise. God didn't put it there so that somebody else could try and put a blanket over it and hide it from your eyes. God put it there. Why? Because God in his word reveals himself. God in his word is showing you his nature. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's in the word to promote faith, not doubt. It's in the word to promote belief, not excuse. But yet so many of our brothers and sisters, they read these passages and immediately try to excuse it away. Immediately try to sweep it under the rug. Don't expect the miraculous. Don't expect the supernatural. Don't even pray for such things. Just deal with life. Just go through life, moan and groan through life. Just try and deal with it the best you can. Because we're being robbed in that instance. We're being robbed of the hope that God gives us. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to live with my hope. My hope and my faith in my God is going to be the first thing that you taste in my life. I'm not going to make excuses for him. I'm not going to try and hide a part of his word. I'm not going to sow seeds of doubt into the holy scriptures of God that he's breathed into these pages and then into my life. I'm going to take him in his word. I'm going to believe his word. I'm going to cling to his word. Because the options are as follows. I will either take God at his word or I'll take somebody else's at theirs. Christian, take God at his word. Oh, that the faith of God's people would get stirred up. And stirred up beyond the point of where you're willing to sing louder. Stirred up beyond the point where you're willing to wear a Christian t-shirt. Stirred up beyond the point where, where you're going to commit to going to church. I'm talking about stirred up to the point where the goodness of God is dripping out of your life. Stirred up to the point where the power of God is evident 
in what you do and what you say and your priorities, in your marriages, in your families, in your homes, in the way that you deal with decisions, in the way that you embrace challenges, in the way that you confront the next giant. That's what it means to be stirred up by God. And that's what we need. In this passage of Scripture, we'll start back with verse 11. Jesus has been on a tear. He's confounding everybody. You either love him or you hate him. There's not many people in the middle on this guy. He, he, was, he was just too amazing to have a, a bland taste. You was either going to love it or you didn't ever want that again. Jesus has just finished doing a miracle for a Roman soldier. Healing. The Roman soldier's boy. Jesus wasn't even at the Roman soldier's house. He didn't even see the Roman soldier's son. He didn't even touch him. Jesus just spoke. And while he was speaking, healing was happening. And so I'm literal when I say Jesus is on a tear. He's doing something. And so now it says in verse 11, soon afterward... Let's go to verse 11, please. There we go. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. And a large crowd followed him. Now, this is important. The context here matters. Jesus has got some people moving with him. It's good to be a part of the people that are moving with Jesus. Jesus is heading to a village. This is not a well-known village. But he's going there just as he did everywhere else that he went with purpose. Jesus, when he leads you, he's leading you with purpose. It may not make sense at the time. Why am I going to Nain? Why are you leading me in this direction? Why are we doing this? I thought we were going to go here. But you just keep following Jesus and you're going to see something. It says a crowd followed him. Now verse 12. It says a funeral procession was coming out. Coming out of what? The village of Nain. It says as he was approaching the village gate, they were coming out of the village gate. So now you have two groups of people. One, a group who is focused on death. And the other a group that is focused on Jesus. It says the young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. So you need to have a proper understanding of what's happening here. A boy of some young age, we don't know exactly, has died. His mother is not only his mother, she is also a widow. She has no husband, and she has no son. He was too young to be married, and so she has no family. This woman, although surrounded by a crowd of people who love her, who are trying to comfort her, who are trying to help her, she's alone. If you've been through that kind of grief, you know that no matter how many people you pack into a room, you just feel like it's you. She's coming out, and death is preceding her. Death is the atmosphere. Everyone is mourning. It had to happen this way because that dead body could not remain inside of that village. It would have defiled that village. The village has to be clean. And so the body has to be buried outside of the village. Here's this helpless woman, and she is helpless. She has nothing and no one. A few friends' shoulders that she can cry on, but other than that, she has no idea what's going to happen next. She has no idea how things are going to work out, what she's going to do where she's going to go, how she's going to survive. She's by herself, alone, mourning the death of her baby boy. Verse 13 tells us that death was confronted with life. The Lord, the Lord of life. As a matter of fact, Jesus declares himself not only to be of life, but to be life itself. He says, I am the resurrection, and the life. 
keep in mind, Christian, life is not something that Jesus just has to offer. It is his nature. Death is not the nature of God. Life is. Life is the nature of God. He's a God of life. He's a God that promotes life. He's a God that creates life. He's a God that supports life. He's a God that values life. He's a God that recognizes life. And he's also a God who mourns when life is lost. It says, when the Lord saw her, his heart, whose heart? The heart of God. This is not the heart of a prophet. This is not the heart of just a miracle worker. This is the heart of God. Jesus is God. The heart of God is being revealed to you now. His heart overflowed, was full and more with what? Compassion. Why is this encouraging? Because you may find yourself in a similar situation one day. And it may not be because you're a widow and you've lost your only child. It may simply be because you're going through something that you had no way to prepare for. It may be that you are enduring a storm that you cannot see the end of. It may be that it's something consistent that is happening in your life and you do not know how to stop it. But there's going to be a time... When you're going to be in this situation and be thankful that the heart of God will be the same towards you then as it was towards this woman. The heart of God is not callous towards you. The heart of God is not unconcerned towards you. The heart of God, he's not flippant concerning your challenges and needs. He's not aloof. Where's God? He's there and he is still filled to the point of overflowing with compassion toward you. I'm so thankful that that's the heart of my God. It's amazing that some people would try to explain away the heart of God. They, they turn him into a very callous king. They turn him into this domineering and still sovereign, but uncaring, disengaged deity. And that is not who God is. That is a misportrayal of his very nature. When someone's heart is being described, it's who they are at their very core who they are. What is the heart of God concerning suffering? What is the heart of God concerning loss? What is the heart of God concerning struggle? What is the heart of God concerning pain? What is it? He's filled with compassion. And it is his heart filled with compassion that causes him to respond. Because he's invested in you because he created you. He's invested in you because he knows you. He's invested in you because he loves you. He's invested in you because he has purpose for you. He's invested in you because you bring him pleasure and glory. And so he wants to respond. The Bible says he looked at the widow and said, don't cry. I could not say those words to a grieving mother. You understand? I can't utter those words. It it takes great authority to say that to someone. And I don't have that kind of authority. Jesus does. And in his full authority, knowing exactly what was happening and what was to follow, he spoke into that woman's life and he said, I don't want you to cry. You imagine the stains from those tears all over her cheeks, down her face. And Jesus' first words to her are not, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. I'm sorry, but 
I, I was doing miracles the other day and you missed it. I, 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 you know, I raised that little girl up and I just feel like one and done's good enough for me. I got to store up my strength for Lazarus. Listen now, that's how Christians are treating our king. That's exactly how Christians are treating our king. They, they treat him as though he, he used to do it uh, for them. He had some reason that we don't understand as to why he did it for them, but he's not available to us, not in that way. He's, he, salvation's available, uh, but the rest he's run out of. Or he just put a stop to. You see Jesus responding to this woman just as he had responded to all the others before her. He says, don't cry. Now look at what he's going to do in verse 14. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it. He didn't touch the boy. He could have. He didn't. He touched the coffin that the little boy was in, the box. Just wood. He put his hand to it, and he spoke very directly, very simply. I'm thankful that God is direct. You see, God doesn't have to beat around the bush. He knows what he's going to do. He knows what he wants. He, he's willing to be very direct. We are not always willing to be direct. We use a lot of words when we don't know how to phrase it the right way. He doesn't need that assistance. He knows what to say. He said, young man, I tell you, who's he talking to? Not the mom. He's not talking to the pallbearers. He's not talking to the extended family. He's talking to a dead body. This is what's happening here now. This is who Jesus is. He talks to a dead body while putting his hand on the box that the dead body is in. And he says, young man, I tell you, I tell you, the same one that spoke life, the same one that created all of this, will speak life anytime he desires. I tell you, get up. That's what he told that little boy to do. Now here, before we go to the next verse, I want you to know something. Luke isn't quite sure how to word this. You're getting ready to see Luke have a little bit of a, what do I say? How do I, how do I describe what happened and so look at verse 15. Then the what? But is he? Is he? Uh, you see what I'm saying? Luke was like, because Luke's a physician. He's a doctor. He knows like death, you know. He's like, no, the, the kid's dead. Well, Jesus, did, he was dead. He's in a coffin. He, that's, he's dead, but he's alive. It says, then the dead boy did something that usually dead bodies don't do. <laughs> Sat up and began to speak. The little boy who was being mourned just a few moments before now, before life confronted death, there was only mourning. There was only despair and grief a lot of unknowns, a lot of questions, a lot of whys. But then life, life confronts death. And life wins. Because life, and I'm talking about capital L life. I'm talking about life, Jesus, life, will always defeat death. The little boy can't do anything but live now. Death, now listen, this is a picture not only of things that are, but also of things that are to come. This is, this is more than just to get one bite, and that's good. There's, there's a lot of bites in this. This is a picture of what Jesus is going to do to death itself. It will be eradicated. Just as it was eradicated from this lifeless body, it'll be eradicated from creation itself. Paul says, death, where is thy sting? Death is slowly Losing its grip, but then one day it's going to be banished, cast out. The power of death is weakening. Do you not see this? The power of death is weakening because the kingdom of God 
is coming. Life is charging to creation. And death is grasping as much as it can because death knows that its time is limited. The days are numbered and there is going to be a death to death. Death's got its own expiration date. Jesus is exemplifying this in this passage of Scripture. He is making sure that the crowd following him and the crowd following that woman both know that he is Lord of life, which means he is Lord over death. I love the personal statement that follows. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Well, what else would you do, right? What, what, what kind of face is she making in this moment? She's astonished. She's in shock. There's, there's all kinds of alarms going off on the inside, but has she been able to actually put it into words yet? I don't know. I don't know. Is she shaking? Is she crying? Is she falling down on the ground? Is she worshiping at his feet? I, I, I don't know. All of that's probably going to happen. But Jesus gives the boy back to the mother. That means he took him out of the box, took him out of the coffin, and gave a live boy back to who had been a grieving mom. Everything that God does is ultimately for his own glory. You need to know this. All of your prayers have to be motivated by this. Love for the Lord and for the glory of the Lord. Don't waste your time if you don't have those two stamped down. First out of love and second for his glory. But here's the great thing about God. He's not selfish. God did this ultimately for his glory, to prove himself, to give evidence that he was who he said he was in the flesh on earth. He's declaring it with his actions just as he's been declaring it with his words. But here's the thing. God, although doing it for his glory, is very glad that it also brings you benefit. He didn't raise this boy back from the dead and then carry him around like a trophy. He gave him to his mother. Here's Here's your son. He's good now. You see, when God works in your life, it's supposed to look the same way. God is going to do the miraculous. He wants to work in incredible ways. It would be impossible if it were anybody else, but with God, all things are possible, the Bible says. And so God's going to do this, and and it's got to be for his glory. It's got to be so that the name of Jesus is exalted above all other names. If God ever does anything for you, you make sure that everybody knows that it was God. Don't try and take the credit. Don't try and act like you had a part to play in it. Don't tell people what you did, and then God did. Just tell them the Lord did it. It's all God. He gets the glory. That woman was not going around saying, look what I did for my son. She was saying, look what Jesus did. And we've got to do that. That's got to be our motive. But here's the thing. It is beautiful. You're going to benefit from it. It's going to bless you. The the added bonus to the power of God is that the people of God get to be a part of it. The people of God get to enjoy it. The people of God get to reap the harvest, the fruit of what God is really doing. I'm not really doing anything. If anything good is happening, it's because God is at work. If anything worthy of praise is occurring, it's because God is moving. But I sure do enjoy getting to be next to him when he does. The next verse tells us this, great fear swept the crowd. There's some oh me's and some oh my's happening. You know, the naysayers, he's a bigger problem than we thought. The followers are like, this is what we were wanting. He has power even over death. Like, we just thought we were getting a king. This, This dude can do anything. 
It says, great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us. God, here it is, God has visited his people today. You see, God still wants to visit. God still wants to move. God still wants to make himself known. God still wants to work. God still cares. He still has compassion. His heart is unchanging. No, if anyone is to blame for a slacking off of the miraculous, it's got to be us. It can't be God. I refuse to blame God. I refuse to pin it on Him. I refuse it. And Christian, I want to encourage you. No matter what you do, never blame God. And no matter what you do, never give up on God. Never. Preacher, are you saying that you still believe that God can raise the dead? Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. Like, that's not even a hard question. Do I believe that God can still raise the dead? Of course I do. He's God. Are you kidding me? Well, how else can I respond when I read the scriptures? How else do you want me to respond to that? Right? But here's the thing. Spiritually speaking, God's raising the dead all the time. I mean, the, the Bible says, now I, I, I'm not going to talk about you. How about I just, I'll just tell you what the Bible says about me. All right? The Bible told me that I was dead in my sins and trespasses. That's what the Bible told me. Now, I'm, you, you can decide if you think that applies to you. I'm, it, it does, but you get, to, you get to decide. I was dead in my sins and trespasses. Dead. And it's a worse death than a physical death because my death was like an eternal death. Like not momentary, but was going to last. I was separated from God. I, I was in a coffin of sin. I, I, nobody around me could help me. They could mourn, but they couldn't fix my problem. They could not resurrect my life. But then life confronted death. Jesus ran into the procession. I was headed on a path to destruction. That's the procession. That's where I was going. And then Jesus got in the way. He stopped the procession in its tracks. I could not stop it myself. He stopped it. And he gave me life. So yes, Jesus is in the resurrection business. When, when you are born again, you are resurrected. You are given. You aren't even given life. You're given new life, the Bible says. Better life, abundant life, eternal life. That's what you get from Jesus. Christian, a passage like this is not supposed to uh, cause us to really just constrain well, it only means that if somebody's in Nain and they've died, maybe Jesus will show back up. Like That's not what this scripture is trying to do. This scripture is trying to cause you to be in awe and wonder of the power of God and of the heart of God behind His power. This passage of scripture is supposed to give you hope to believe God for the miraculous. This scripture is not about that widow. It's not even about that boy. They benefited from God being there. This is about God putting himself on display and saying, look at who I am. Look at what I can do. Look at my heart. Look at why I do these things. Look at the motivation behind it. And now come to me and ask me. Come to me and cry out to me. Put your faith in me. Believe me. Trust me. Look to me. Just imagine what I can do. It may be impossible for everyone else. It is not impossible for me. Christian, your faith is supposed to be stirred up at a passage like this. You're supposed to walk away from this message having said, you know what, I've, I've been doubting too much, but now I'm going to start believing a little more. 
It's okay for there to be some repentance that might occur when you're confronted with this passage. It's okay to say, God, I am so sorry. I apologize for considering that you would be any different than what your word reveals you to be. I apologize that I would ever put doubt in you or cast blame on you. Instead, God, I want to believe you. I want to trust you. I'm in awe of you. I'm amazed by you. Christian, when your faith is stirred up, it is going to promote your desiring God and the things of God and that it would happen more and in abundance in your life. That's what the Lord desires. He says that there's going to come a time and We've entered into this time, we have, ever since Pentecost actually, of the outpouring of His Spirit. It started on the day of Pentecost. But it's not presented as something that was going to trickle. It may flow at first, but then trickle at last. It's actually presented the opposite of that. That God wants to increase the intensity of His working and moving on earth before His return. Before the culmination of all things, Scripture presents that God is wanting to become more active through His people as they believe Him for it. And I'm telling you now, if there's ever been a time for faith, it's today. If there's ever been a time for believing God, whether it's for something that you need tangibly or whether it's for a new life in Christ that you need eternally, there's never been a better time to put your faith in Him than today. Let Him breathe life into you let him work his miracles in you because if you don't all you're going to be is a bystander because he will still move I promise he is going to move he is going to work and you can either sit by and watch or you can get in and enjoy. I want to ask you to stand with me, please. It is so good for you to get stirred up a little bit this morning. It's good for you to be reminded of what the Bible says because the Bible's got authority in my life, see. When I read the Word of God, it's supposed to change me. I'm not looking to water it down. I'm actually looking for Him to fill me up. I'm not looking for a reason to disbelieve. I'm looking to the Word of God that it would promote greater faith in my life. And I want to get stirred up and I need to get stirred up. I need passages like this and messages like this to remind me of who He is. And Christian, I have no idea what it is that you may be mourning right now. I don't know what you might see as a lost cause in your life. This is not going to get any better. I'm just going to have to deal with it. I don't know. I don't know. But I want you to know this. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to know that. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that he is the unchanging one. And the Bible says that his heart draws near to his people. The Bible says that he hears the cry of his people. Call unto me, and I will answer thee. That's what the Bible says. I want to encourage you to take him at his word and to take him at his heart as well. Lord, I believe your heart. I believe it is still overflowing with compassion. I believe that you look upon me and where I'm at the same way that you did that woman. I have no reason to think otherwise. I believe that you are just as concerned as you were then. Just as interested. And Lord, that woman couldn't do anything about where she was at. She she brought nothing to the table. She's not even recorded as to have spoken. Lord, what can I bring? I just need you to stand in the way 
of what's happening. I need you to stop the procession. And I need you to speak. I need you to do the work. I admit I cannot. And I need you to get the glory. Even though I'm going to benefit. You're going to have to get the glory. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Bow your heads for a moment. And respond to the Lord as the Spirit of God leads you. Father, as your people called by your name, washed by your blood, saved by your grace, it is an honor for us to believe you. It's an honor to trust you. You. I don't know who gets the glory when we doubt God but I'm not living for them I am going to believe you and even in my believing you will be glorified bless you. We bless your name. We bless your heart. We bless your word. We bless your will. And we bless all that you seek to do as you make yourself known on this earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, y'all. I am thankful (laughs) that we got to worship together today. I really am thankful for the music and uh, prayer time and all that good stuff. Now, uh, next week's going to look a little bit different, all right? So I want you to look at somebody close to you and say, it's going to be different next week. Please tell them, tell them. And I don't mean that I'm going to come in here wearing a suit and tie. That's not that kind of different. We're actually like not even going to be here next week. We're going to be at the Watson stage, uh, which is over on the campus of Wilkes Community College. Once a year in the fall, we do church over there, and we do it for a couple of reasons. But one is so that our 820 crowd and our 11 crowd can come together in a space big enough to hold us, and there's room over there for all of us. And two is because some of y'all are better cooks than you let on, and we want to eat that good cooking. Yeah, a lot of deviled eggs. We, we will dedicate a table just to the deviled eggs. And I'm believing God to lead at least six of you to make them. We need to have a sign-up sheet, really. Um, we're, we're going, and this information is, is in the bulletin, but I just want to highlight it because it is really important that you don't show up here next week at 11 o'clock. All right, because we're going to be down there. 
So it'll start at 10. We're going to have our service first. Our priest team will be there. It's going to be fantastic. We do, it'll be like, kind of like old school. We, we can intentionally do a little old school, okay, because it's the setting, you know. So we'll worship at 10, and then right after we'll eat. Now, when I say we're going to eat your food, that's exactly what I mean. Because all the church is providing are like uh, forks. We're just going to walk down the line. No, uh, the church will take care of the drinks and the plates, cups, all that stuff. But you need to bring, you know, like a big main uh, and then a side and, and a dessert, okay? Bring multiple of those if you would like, but at, at least bring one of each. And then we're going to lay it out on these tables, and we're all just going to, I mean, it's a mess, to be honest with you. There's food flying everywhere. People are slipping on baked beans. It's something. It's something. Um, but we're going to have a great time. The other thing that I need to let you know about is this insert that's in your bulletin. We're having discipleship groups that are starting the first Wednesday in October. If you've done D groups before, would you raise your hand? So there's a lot of people that did not raise their hand. Uh, you need to try D groups at least one time. It's six weeks. It's on Wednesday nights. Uh, these are your options. We ask that you circle two of these and then fill out the information and put it in the offering basket as you leave. And this is going to help us uh, make sure the classes are pretty even if you'll circle two that you'd like to take. One class is women's only, all right? And so all of the other classes are available for everyone. But please do this today or like next Sunday because we have to get all our material in order and everything like that. But D groups are fantastic and they will bless you. Just like you're getting ready to bless somebody on your way out of here. You ready? Now I hope that this message will encourage you to bless them knowing who you're blessing them with. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Y'all